In a high-stakes geopolitical chess game, could the United States and Iran, both desperately trying to sidestep a catastrophic war, inadvertently spiral into one? This terrifying scenario looms as tensions escalate under the watchful eyes of President Joe Biden and Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. In a dramatic turn of events, early February saw the US unleash retaliatory strikes against Iranian-aligned militants. But Biden has clearly stated that his goal is merely deterrence, not war, even if Iran is supplying weapons and training to groups currently attacking American, Israeli, and Western targets in Yemen, Syria, and Lebanon. But here's the twist. Iran denies direct control, claiming these groups are rogue actors. This shadow play doesn't ease the growing tension, which feels like a ticking time bomb, ready to ignite a broader conflict. Biden himself has hinted at a dangerous precipice, where a multi-front war could erupt suddenly, trapping the US in a labyrinth with no clear exit. As the narrative unfolds, Iranian-supported militants have relentlessly targeted US troops mainly in Iraq. The burning question is, how deep does Iran's influence run within these militant groups? Are we witnessing a careful orchestration or a loose cannon scenario? And ultimately, how far are these two nations willing to go in this ominous game of brinksmanship and intrigue? The dispute between Iran and the US has intensified significantly since October 7, 2023, when, starting at approximately 6.30 a.m. local time, Hamas led a highly coordinated and brutal attack against the state of Israel. Along with a sizable contingent of Hamas fighters, the attacking force consisted of various other Palestinian militant groups, including the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, or PIJ. The assault began with a massive barrage of more than 2,200 rockets, most of which were launched into Israel in the first 20 minutes. This opening salvo reportedly overwhelmed Israel's sophisticated anti-missile defense system known as the Iron Dome. Ideally, this system would have intercepted and destroyed all short-range rockets or artillery shells fired from 4 to 70 kilometers away, but because of the sheer volume, a large number made it through. The attack took place on Shemini Atzeret, a Jewish holiday, presumably because large numbers of Israeli Defense Force soldiers would be on leave and the IDF would be primarily focused on Israel's northern border rather than on the Gaza Strip to the south. And as the rockets rained down on Israel, some 2,500 Hamas, PIJ and other fighters stormed through Israel's fortified border using explosives and bulldozers to clear their path. Once inside, they disabled several of the communication networks used to connect nearby Israeli military posts, allowing them to remain undetected for some time as they attacked those installations and murdered civilians at will. While this was happening, jihadist fighters using motorboats also breached Israeli's sea border near the coastal town of Zikim, while others entered Israel by air using motorized paragliders. On what would become the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust, around 1,400 people were killed, including IDF soldiers, families that were attacked in their homes, and attendees of an outdoor music festival. Most of the casualties were Israeli civilians, but a number of foreign nationals were also murdered in the attack. While an estimated 240 others were hauled back to the Gaza Strip as hostages. Among the hostages were a large number of Israelis with dual citizenship, collectively representing nearly two dozen other countries. In the wake of this attack, the Israeli government vowed to destroy Hamas and remove it from power, and within hours, the IDF would kick off an intensive air campaign against Hamas forces in Gaza, as Israeli troops marched into the Palestinian enclave in preparation for the major ground operation to come. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also pledged to do his best to minimize civilian casualties, but also warned all Palestinians living in the northern region of the Gaza Strip that they'd better evacuate immediately and head south. But as the war in Gaza has raged on, the violence of the conflict has continued to escalate right along with all the usual horrors of war, as well as the simmering tensions between several opposing nations. And this has left much of the international community asking, could the Israel-Gaza war spark a wider conflict, perhaps one involving the US and Iran? It's unsettling to think that escalation on this scale is possible, but given recent events, it's begun to seem increasingly possible, even inevitable. During the first few weeks of 2024 alone, a senior leader of Hamas, Salah al aruri the chair of Hamas's political bureau, was killed during a carefully orchestrated airstrike on a Hezbollah stronghold south of Beirut, Lebanon. Then, in retaliation, the Shia Islamist extremist group Hezbollah launched a rocket attack against an Israeli air surveillance base on Mount Meron. Then the US, also in the spirit of retaliation, used a drone strike to assassinate one of the Hezbollah Brigade's senior leaders in Iraq. 
while the Houthis, another Yemeni group of Iran-backed rebels, traded fire with the US Navy. And with every one of these strikes and counterstrikes, the likelihood that the war in Gaza will spill out across the region increased dramatically. As things stand, we're getting dangerously close to the end of a decades-old standoff, with the US and Israel on one side and Iran and its allied militant groups on the other. A few more wrong moves, and this violent chess match might erupt into a full-on war of nations that drags much of the Middle East region into chaos. With this sort of conflict, though, it's difficult to know what the tipping point will be. For example, the recent rocket attack against the base on Mount Meron came just one day after Hezbollah leader Syed Hassan Nasrallah said he must respond to the death of al arori even though Israel has yet to claim responsibility for the attack. As the commander in charge of Hamas operations in the West Bank and one of the founders of the military wing of Hamas, the Izzedine al qassam brigades, al arori wasn't a nobody. In fact, he was a crucial link in the chain connecting Hamas, Iran, and Hezbollah. After the civil war in Syria began, and Hamas chose to side not with the Bashar al-Assad regime but with the opposition, a rift emerged, with Hamas clearly on one side and Iran and Hezbollah firmly on the other. Over the last five years, however, al aruri has been deeply involved in re-establishing that alliance, even leading negotiations between Hamas, Iran, and Hezbollah leadership. This could certainly be why Nasrallah was so compelled to retaliate. In the short term, things might be difficult for Hamas, but as it's done in the past, when other leaders have been assassinated by Israel, the group will likely survive the death of al aruri But if nothing was done to avenge such a high-status player like Aruri, then all of Lebanon might become vulnerable to Israeli attack. As far as we know, there's still no evidence that Iran or Hezbollah played a direct role or even knew about the October 7th attack before it happened. But given Israel's swift, heavy-handed response, truly one of the most devastating military campaigns of the 21st century, Iran and its allies across the region have had no choice but to get involved. For if Iran were to leave Hamas to face Israel's retribution on their own, it would potentially risk undoing a military alliance that's been evolving since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. But by backing Hamas, indirectly at least, Iran appears to have put itself on a direct collision course with the West. And yet, to avoid dragging its benefactor into a full-scale war, Hezbollah especially will need to tread carefully. It can't simply tolerate US attacks, like the airstrike in Beirut that killed al aruri without looking weak or unreliable. But if their retaliatory actions end up sparking a war between, let's say, Israel and Lebanon, a country that's already facing a severe economic crisis, this might be too heavy a price to pay. Even if Hezbollah has carried out strikes along the Israeli border nearly every day since the conflict in Gaza started and Israel has routinely returned fire, each side appears to be carefully limiting the intensity of these clashes. The Biden administration seems to have taken a similarly cautious approach with Iran. For even as US forces target Iranian proxies in Iraq and Syria, they have not launched any attacks inside Iran. And even as Tehran uses its so-called axis of resistance, Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, and Kataib Hezbollah in Iraq and Syria as its first line of defense against the US and Israel, it also appears to be taking measures to prevent the expansion of the war beyond the point of no return. Both in public and in private, Iran has praised Hezbollah's sacrifices, but at the same time cautioned that a war with Israel would be harmful to their larger ambitions in the region. But still, there's no denying that the Israel-Hamas conflict has already begun to escalate. The overall amount of death and destruction happening in Gaza vastly increased, mostly due to the indiscriminate use of increasingly powerful weapons. We've also seen this conflict spread as additional countries and militia groups, for one reason or another, get drawn into the carnage. Even before Israel's ground invasion of Gaza began at the end of October, the magnitude and scale of the firepower the IDF was using increased substantially. Recently, it's been estimated that some 70% of Gaza's homes and half of all other buildings have been damaged or destroyed, reaching a magnitude of devastation comparable to that of the Allied bombing of Dresden or Hamburg during World War II. Meanwhile, within the first 90 days of the conflict, more than 22,000 residents have been killed, and 85% of the population, nearly 2 million people, had been displaced. Inaccurate and contradictory evacuation orders coming from the IDF have also been a problem, these orders are also often transmitted via telecommunications networks that require electricity, two basic utilities that have been highly unreliable, if not absent altogether, in many areas of Gaza since the invasion. 
Many Gazans have also complained that under international law, those who choose not to evacuate still maintain their right to protection, meaning that if Israel, as the invading force, is telling people to leave, they must also ensure the safety, dignity, liberty and security of those being displaced. This should include, at a minimum, the continued maintenance of an adequate standard of living and regular access to humanitarian assistance. Israel's blockade, however, has made reliable access to humanitarian aid extremely difficult, leaving thousands if not millions of Palestinians living in appalling conditions. Even as far back as December 2023, the Secretary General of the United Nations warned that the humanitarian system in Gaza was nearing the point of total collapse. And recently the situation has only gotten worse, as hundreds of Israeli protesters, many of whom are family members of yet-to-be-released hostages, have attempted to block aid trucks from entering Gaza through the Kerem Shalom border crossing. After days of protests, delays and stoppages, as protesters continued to demand that no aid be allowed to enter Gaza via Israel until every hostage was set free, the IDF was forced to establish a closed military zone around the crossing, making it illegal for any civilians to be in the vicinity of the crossing or on nearby roads. The border region between Israel and Lebanon has also become a problem, as skirmishes between IDF and Hezbollah break out almost daily. This has prompted some 150,000 displaced locals to flee northern Israel and southern Lebanon, turning this region into a landscape of abandoned towns and neglected farms. Most of these Lebanese residents who've been displaced have received little to no help from the government, which is currently suffering a financial meltdown, the result of years of corruption and mismanagement, while the Israeli government, on the other hand, has reportedly been providing housing and food to many of its displaced citizens. Recently, the Biden administration has been trying to broker a deal between Israel, Lebanon and Hezbollah, but has so far been unsuccessful in reducing current tensions and moving Hezbollah forces away from the border. Hampering these and other negotiations could be the fact that the US will not negotiate directly with Hezbollah, which it has designated a terrorist organization, leaving the Lebanese Foreign Minister, Prime Minister and Speaker of Parliament to act as intermediaries in the negotiations. More than a decrease in the violence in northern Israel, though, what Biden would really like to see is the Lebanese armed forces becoming the sole border force on Lebanon's side of the border. This won't likely happen, though, until the war in Gaza comes to an end and Hezbollah is either annihilated along with Hamas or retreats deeper into Lebanon. Another Iranian-backed group that has continued to rally behind Hamas are the Houthis, a heavily armed Shia Muslim political religious faction coming out of Yemen. Alongside Hamas and Hezbollah, the Houthis have also declared themselves to be part of the Iranian-led Axis of Resistance, or the unofficial League of Extremist Groups who've aligned themselves against Israel, the US, and the West more generally. Having emerged in the 1990s, the Houthis were originally known as the Ansar Allah, or Partisans of God, but they've since adopted the name of the movement's late founder, Hussein al-Houthi. And since the early 2000s, under the leadership of the founder's brother, Abdul Malik al-Houthi, the Houthis have been fighting a series of rebellions against Yemen's longtime authoritarian president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, in an attempt to gain sovereignty over their homeland in the north of the country. At the moment, the Houthis control Sana'a and the northwest of Yemen, including the Red Sea coastline, a large area where most of Yemen's population lives, where they run a de facto government which collects taxes and prints its own money. In solidarity with Hamas, at the start of the Gaza invasion, the Houthis began attacking Israel with missiles and drone strikes, but the majority of these have been intercepted. Where the Houthis have really been making an impact is out on the Red Sea, as they've increasingly targeted ships which are Israeli-owned, flagged or operated, or heading to Israeli ports. Most of the vessels they've attacked, however, have had no connection with Israel and this has prompted a number of major shipping companies to cease their operations in the Red Sea, opting for a much longer and safer route around the southern tip of Africa. But after more than two dozen attacks, the US and 11 other nations decided to assemble an international maritime coalition, with the primary goal of maintaining freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. Given that some 30% of global container trade passes through the Suez Canal, the Houthis have caused some huge disruptions to industry and related supply chains, and the coalition has had enough. In a stern warning to Houthis, the coalition demanded they cease their attacks immediately and release any detained vessels or crews, or else. The Houthis, however, seem undeterred as they continue to threaten lives on the Red Sea and, in turn, face the consequences. 
Despite US Navy ships and jets shooting down a number of Houthi drones and missiles, some current and former US defense officials have argued that this won't be enough to deter the increasingly bold, almost daily attacks occurring in the Red Sea. And when this turned out to be correct, staying true to their word, the US and UK launched a series of strikes against Houthi targets in Yemen. Some of the most recent strikes have employed US F-A-18 fighter jets launched from the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, along with a hail of Tomahawk missiles sent from two Navy destroyers, the USS Gravely and the USS Kearney. The US also recently hit targets associated with other Iranian-backed militias and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard in Iraq and Syria, reportedly in retaliation to the drone strike on the logistics support base at Tower 22 of the Jordanian Defense Network that killed three US service members the week before. On top of that, sometime in early February, the US carried out a cyber attack against an Iranian military ship suspected of collecting intelligence on cargo vessels in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. The details of the operation remain classified, but overall, the objective was to inhibit the ship's ability to share intelligence with Houthi rebels in the area. After the attack, Iran's UN ambassador, Amir Saeed Erevani, claimed that the vessel in question was in the Red Sea to combat pirate activities and was not providing intelligence to Houthi forces. But even if Iran maintains their support of the Houthis is solely political, the US has continued to accuse Tehran of enabling them to terrorize civilian operations in the Red Sea. Take, for example, the recent analysis conducted by the US Defense Intelligence Agency that confirmed Houthi forces had been using Iranian-made missiles and UAVs in their attacks. As far back as 2014, the analysis revealed, Iran's Quds Force, a branch of its Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps that specializes in unconventional warfare and military intelligence, has provided the Houthis with a growing arsenal of sophisticated weapons as well as training. With all the havoc being created by the so-called three H's, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis, it's hard to say exactly how close we really are to seeing a full-scale war breakout between some combination of the US, Iran, Lebanon, and Israel. If Iran were to directly attack Israel or some American asset, let's say in retaliation to the US Navy's continued attacks on the Houthis, would that be the spark that ignites the next major conflict in the Middle East? The isolated attacks and skirmishes we've seen so far haven't been enough to warrant direct military action from Iran. Even if they don't approve of Israel's invasion into Gaza, it seems Iran's leaders would rather avoid a war, a war that would very likely involve the US. And so far, Iran's leaders have taken a more pragmatic approach. Their primary concern seems to be the preservation and progress of their country, and a war with the US and Israel is not one they would likely win. Something that could also escalate things, spreading the Israel-Hamas conflict beyond its current borders, would be if Israel gets fed up with Hezbollah and decides to attack Iran directly. The IDF has been managing the Hezbollah threat pretty well so far, but if Iran continues to support the group with cash, weapons and training, Israel may have no choice but to officially pull Tehran into the fray. There's also the possibility that other Arab countries, such as Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, or the United Arab Emirates, will take up arms against Israel, but this is less likely. For even if Israel's current campaign in Gaza has outraged much of the Arab world, there's nothing that indicates right now that any major Arab country will intervene on behalf of the besieged Gazans. It should be noted as well that few Arab states, especially Egypt, have little sympathy for Hamas. Despite their current disapproval of Israel, most countries, including Iran, will likely remain hesitant to get directly involved, at least as long as the US maintains its current presence in the region. Back in early October 2023, the US deployed two aircraft carrier strike groups to the eastern Mediterranean Sea. These warships were never intended to join the fighting in Gaza or take part in Israel's operations, but the deployment of two of the most powerful vessels in the Navy's fleet did come with a clear message to Iran and its proxies. Stay out of it. The first carrier to arrive was the USS Gerald R. Ford, followed by the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. Ideally, this show of force would deter hostile action against Israel, limiting the scale of the war. For now, the Eisenhower and its contingent of some 60 aircraft, as well as a guided missile cruiser and two guided missile destroyers, will remain in the region. The Ford, on the other hand, recently returned to its home port in Norfolk, Virginia. But even without its newest and most advanced aircraft carrier, the US 6th Fleet will continue to maintain a commanding presence in the eastern Mediterranean. This includes guided missile destroyers, which have been responsible for bringing down a number of Houthi drones and missiles, as well as the USS Bataan, an amphibious assault ship carrying Marine Corps F-35 stealth fighters and other members of the Bataan Amphibious Ready Group, 
including the USS Carter Hall and USS Mesa Verde. Don't be fooled by this grand display of force, however, because even if the US rushed to the aid of Israel immediately following Hamas's attack, the last thing the US wants after two decades of costly fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan is another war in the Middle East. If Washington isn't careful, though, that's exactly what it's going to get. If their recent actions in Baghdad and Beirut haven't been antagonistic enough, the US has also been criticized for its ongoing supply of military aid to Israel, despite increased reports of civilian casualties. In fact, the civilian-led human rights organization Amnesty International has even alleged that fragments of a Joint Direct Attack Munitions Guidance System, or JDAM, were found at the scene of an October 2023 bombing where 43 civilians were killed. It's common knowledge that Israel uses a wide variety of weapons and munitions provided by the US, but this was one of the first times an American-made weapon was tied to a specific attack. According to the organization, this event had to be either a direct attack on civilians or an indiscriminate attack and should therefore be investigated as a potential war crime. In response, an IDF representative adamantly disputed this report, insisting the claims being made by Amnesty International were biased, baseless, and premature. Pentagon spokesperson Air Force Major General Patrick Ryder added that the US would continue to consult closely with its Israeli partners on the importance of minimizing civilian casualties. Still, there have been those, primarily former President Donald Trump and his supporters, that have criticized President Biden for being too soft on Iran, especially concerning his response to the drone attack that killed three soldiers in Jordan. In hindsight, both camps have resorted to blaming the other. Trump ordered the assassination of Iranian Major General Qasem Soleimani, but Biden lifted the sanctions on Tehran. But Trump chose to withdraw from the 2015 nuclear deal, but now Biden isn't responding forcefully enough to Iran-backed attacks on US troops. Depending on who in Washington you ask, each one of these actions or inactions has either emboldened Iran or kept the US from starting a war. There have been top national security officials who served under Trump as well as congressional Republicans who have accused Biden of failing to prevent these recent attacks, arguing that the drone strike in Jordan wouldn't have happened if Trump were president. But officials in Biden's corner were quick to shoot back, pointing out that deadly attacks linked to Iran did happen on Trump's watch. But perhaps Biden has simply been more concerned with helping his friends than attacking his enemies. As one of the first countries to recognize the State of Israel's Declaration of Independence back in 1948, the US has remained one of Israel's closest allies ever since. Driven by shared democratic values, strategic interests, and cultural ties, over the years this relationship has evolved and strengthened as the US has continued to provide military, economic, and diplomatic support. Even through various changes in leadership, shifts in regional dynamics, and disagreements over specific policies, this relationship has survived, and overall, the alliance between the two remains strong. So why would anyone expect the US to stand back now? As Hamas continues to openly oppose Palestinian recognition of the State of Israel as it wages its campaign of terror in an attempt to derail a peaceful future for not just these two nations, but the broader Arab region. What began smoldering in the mid-20th century has continued to burn for decades, becoming one of the world's longest-running disputes between two nations. But it wasn't until 2007, after Hamas emerged as the de facto authority in the Gaza Strip and Israel and Egypt established a blockade around the area, that the stage would be set for a decade and a half of back-and-forth outbursts of violence. Ever since the first major conflict erupted between Israel and Hamas in 2008, the Gaza Strip has experienced ongoing destruction and horrendous civilian casualties. Over the years, periodic ceasefire agreements have temporarily eased tensions, prompting Israel to lift its blockade and allow for much-needed foreign aid to make its way into the Gaza Strip. Also, as the years have passed, some Israeli officials began to believe that Hamas was slowly starting to relent, and even if there continue to be occasional flare-ups of violence, this could be manageable in the long term. But on October 7th, that all changed, and the error of this assumption became tragically clear. While Iran had been strengthening its influence and forming alliances with other entities in the region, the Israeli leadership had become distracted by ongoing violence in the West Bank, political turmoil at home, and simmering tensions with Hezbollah in Lebanon, leaving Israel drastically unprepared for the attack to come. But this still leaves the question, why now? Many experts believe Hamas's sudden escalation of violence was intended to derail the potential peace agreement that was being brokered by the US between Saudi Arabia and Israel. 
As part of this agreement, Saudi Arabia intended to address Palestine's concerns in general, but the Palestinians were not directly involved in the discussions, and this did not sit well with Hamas, and we all know what happened after that. Less than two hours after the attack began, the IDF announced a state of alert, letting the Israeli public know that war was imminent. Soon, Israel began mobilizing its reserve army units, calling up more than 350,000 troops over the next few days. Another two hours later, IDF fighter jets began pounding the Gaza Strip with airstrikes. Then, on October 8, Israel officially declared itself to be at war with Hamas, prompting Prime Minister Netanyahu to warn Gazan residents that they'd better get out as soon as possible, for Israeli troops would be coming soon, and they'd be coming with all their might. Another day later, Israel began a full-on siege of the Gaza Strip, cutting off much of the region's supply of water, electricity, food, and fuel. In the midst of the crisis, an ongoing international effort is being made to secure the release of the hostages and hopefully end the conflict, but even that might not be enough for Israel, as it seems wholly determined to root out and destroy every last member of Hamas. Adding to the difficulty of locating the hostages, as well as targeting Hamas militants and weapons caches, is Gaza's subterranean tunnel system, an intricate web of passageways extending for hundreds of kilometers. These tunnels are used by Hamas as well as other Gazans to get around the blockade, conduct operations, and hide from Israeli forces. Fighting throughout these tunnels, however, is not easy and creates a deadly situation for all those inside, especially IDF troops and the hostages who might be held there but destroying them without civilian casualties has also proved to be difficult. Gaza's highly dense population also presents a unique challenge for IDF troops on the ground. The official second phase of the war began on October 27th and included a comprehensive ground invasion into the northern Gaza Strip, an area that was supposed to have been previously evacuated. The IDF planned to split the Gaza Strip, compelling Palestinian civilians to move southwards while targeting isolated Hamas units in the north. Electronic communication in most of Gaza was initially suspended, with the intention of restricting Hamas's ability to organize their defense. But this also seriously limited the ability of medical and humanitarian organizations to respond to emergencies. On October 27, the Rafah border crossing between the Gaza Strip and Egypt was opened, under conditions agreed to by Egypt, Hamas, and Israel, allowing a limited number of foreign nationals to leave Gaza for the first time since the war broke out. Three weeks later, on November 22nd, the Israeli government agreed to a prisoner exchange with Hamas, mediated by Qatar and Egypt, that would include a temporary ceasefire. This lasted seven days, and in exchange for 240 Palestinian prisoners, 110 of the hostages were freed. But when the fighting ultimately resumed, Israeli forces moved into Khan Yunis, the largest urban center in the south of the Gaza Strip and the suspected location of many of Hamas's senior leaders. Up until March 2024, a staggering 1.9 million Palestinians, more than 80% of the population, have been internally displaced, and as the number of casualties has continued to climb, this has evolved into the deadliest conflict for Palestinians since the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. But the mounting number of civilian casualties and extensive destruction in Gaza has not come without scores of fiery criticisms. Even President Biden has noted that Israel is beginning to lose international support. By early January 2024, over 22,000 Palestinians had been reported dead, prompting Israel to announce a change in strategy that would result in a more targeted approach. And by the end of January, the number of average daily deaths dropped to one-third of what it was back in October. But still, as Israel expands its invasion into the southern Gaza Strip, millions of Palestinian civilians have been left with nowhere to go, caught between the Israeli army, the sealed Egyptian border, and the Mediterranean Sea. There's been rampant speculation about what Israel's ultimate intentions are for the trapped Palestinians. One option that Israel has apparently considered is to move the nearly 2 million displaced Palestinians across the border into Egypt's Sinai Desert first into tent encampments before eventually building permanent cities. This idea was first proposed in what Prime Minister Netanyahu's office called a concept paper, drafted by Israel's intelligence ministry, a junior ministry that conducts research but does not set policy shortly after the start of the war. When this report was first leaked, Palestinians across the board immediately condemned the idea claiming that it echoed their people's greatest tragedy, the displacement of hundreds of thousands of them following Israel's independence back in 1948. 
The report wasn't viewed favorably by Cairo either, but took it as evidence that Israel might try to shift the burden of Gaza onto Egypt. Even though Egypt ruled over Gaza between 1948 and 67, when Israel first captured the territory, along with the West Bank and East Jerusalem, the vast majority of Gaza's current population are the descendants of Palestinian refugees uprooted from what is now Israel. Critics of the Sinai Desert idea also pointed out that Egypt might not necessarily be the refugees' last stop, given that the report also mentions Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates as being potential supporters of the plan, either financially or by taking in Gazan refugees as long-term residents. Canada was also identified as a potential area for resettlement given its lenient immigration practices. The report also introduces but at the same time dismisses two other options, one, reinstating the West Bank-based Palestinian Authority, or two, actively supporting a new local regime. The report did not outline what would become of Gaza once its population is completely cleared out, but its authors seem to believe that this was the best outcome in terms of Israel's long-term security. Facing heavy criticism, the Prime Minister's office was quick to downplay the report as a hypothetical exercise, pointing out that right now they are primarily focused on destroying the governing and military capabilities of Hamas, a goal that many doubt is even possible given the group's deep roots in Palestinian society. Right now, the humanitarian situation in Gaza is in freefall, as Israeli attacks have continued across the Gaza Strip with little let-up and the death toll in the enclave continues to climb. And as this violent conflict expands beyond the borders of Palestine, we can't help but ask, when and how is this going to end? There are hard questions to answer, but what's become increasingly clear is that as long as Israel keeps up its offensive in Gaza, regional tensions are likely to remain high, and while the US continues to provide crucial military and diplomatic support to Israel, it's hard to say what will provoke Biden to actually intervene at the moment, even Iran appears to be under the impression that the US would prefer to stay on the sidelines of this war, not to mention avoid entering one with them. But despite Iran's desire for the same, if it keeps on supporting Hamas and allowing Hezbollah and the Houthis to attack US bases and terrorize international shipping, a war with the US might be exactly what they get. But what do you think? How much more of this back and forth will the US put up with? Are Iran and the US on an unavoidable collision course? Could a wider conflict break out involving Iran, Israel, Lebanon and the US? What would that look like? Be sure to let us know in the comments. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Now go and check out Could Israel's Iron Beam Replace the Iron Dome? Or click this other video instead.